So I'm going to give my whole uh, talk under the, oops. There we are. Under the auspices of uh, Charles Ray's supreme Hinoki, um, one of the sculptures of uh, the last decade that I admire uh, completely without reservation. Um, so as Jack said, um, I come here from a checkered past. Uh, that is to say my, my entry into art criticism and my intensive activity um, in my boyhood uh, was based on uh, a complete commitment on which I've never reneged in the slightest um, to the art and the achievements and the values of high modernism. Uh, for me, great sculpture meant uh, David Smith and um, the alas, um, deceased Anthony Caro, I'll say more about Caro in a moment, um, and the paintings of Pollock, Lewis, Nolan, Dolitsky, uh, great abstract expressionists, and so on. Um, in 1967, as uh, many of you will know, I wrote Art and Objecthood, in which I uh, uh, criticized severely, let's say attacked, um, emerging minimalism, not because I thought it was unimportant, I thought it was important, and I think Art and Objecthood takes it very, very seriously. Um, I thought it was a very significant development in contemporary art. I also thought and still think that it was fundamentally wrong, that it drew, drew the wrong conclusions theoretically and that it drew the wrong conclusions artistically and that it introduced an era of what I called theatricality, um, which very much fed into an emerging postmodernism um, and interactive art and involving the experience of the beholder, of the subject, the human subject, in new ways, and all sorts of things that seem to me finally appalling. Um, <laughs> I also, um, although I had regarded myself until that moment as a dialectical thinker, um, I see in retrospect that I lost faith in the dialectic and that I thought, okay, it's going to be direct from here on out, so get used to it, suck it up. Um, and fortunately, I had a lot of art historical work to do, um, which began, uh, of course, with getting back to the middle of the French 18th century, where I thought the task that I set myself, even going back to being a graduate student, the art historical task, was to try to generate something like a prehistory of modernism. If one takes modernism, however crudely one understands it, to begin with someone like Manet in France in the 1860s and his generation. So the historical question, which had not been broached, um, was how did it come to pass that one day somebody got out of bed um, on the right bank and got dressed and went to the studio and started to paint the Dejeuner sur Lab? It still seems an extraordinary thing to have happened. Uh, and the more I looked into it, the more it seemed that you had to get back to the middle of the 18th century, um, to painting like Chardin and Greuze and eventually David, and above all, the art criticism and theory of the divine, Denis Diderot, to understand it. And that led to the writing of three books, Absorption in Theatricality, Courbet's Realism, Manet's Modernism, trying to lay out um, a certain kind of highly motivated narrative uh, involving precisely what had been the issue in uh, the emergence of minimalism, as I saw it, in an object would namely the question of what would be the right, the correct, uh, the anti-theatrical relation between work and viewer. It's also therefore the emergence of a certain ideal, which becomes the high modernist ideal of aesthetic autonomy, um, in which I admit I still believe. So um, that was, uh, the background, um, and I was not writing criticism, uh, but I was writing num books on other subjects as well. Um, and then I became aware, belatedly, way after most people in uh, the world of contemporary art, uh, way after Jack, for example, um, I became aware of ambitious tableau-sized art photography, um, the work of people like Wall and Bustamante, and Ruff and Strut and Gursky, the Dusseldorf School, and so on and so forth. Um, I came to that uh, very late, uh, but I came to that with a sense of excitement. Um, because, not because this was 
photography that was like painting. That still seems to me the wrong way to think about it, um, or a shallow way to think about it. But because once photographs started to be made at a certain scale, and above all for the wall, as the French critic Jean-Francois Chevrier saw, um, th these photographs were made for the wall, then what I saw to add to that is, once they're made for the wall, in a sense as never before, then they engage whether they want to or not, whether the photographer meant it or not in the first place, they engage with the question of the relation of the work to the viewer. They inherit the issues of high modernism, they inherit the issues of the uh, contretemps, the conflict between high modernism and minimalism. And as I was reading them, as I have read them, I think they come out, as one might say, on the right side. Um, this led also to waking up to a certain, certain developments in video, the, uh, video and a certain kind of art film, the work of artists like Henri Sala, Douglas Gordon, Philippe Pereno, um, and that too I, I, I found thrilling. Now on one trip that I made, I'd have to go back, Charlie, we'd have to figure out what the date was, but it was when uh, Bill Viola was showing The Passions. Um, at uh, the Getty. And because of this emerging interest that I was developing in things like video, I felt I had to see them. Um, I was quite sure that I would hate the passions, and when I went and saw them, I did. Uh, but one of the things that, um, if you are a practicing critic, um, the sure intuition that you are going to hate something is not finally a rhetorical, powerful weapon to use if you haven't seen it. Um, so even though you so often know beforehand what you're likely to feel, you got to go check it out. And then you can say, yeah, I saw it. It was just dreadful. Um, <laughs> so that was one of the pleasures of that trip. Another was um, uh, s spending a lot of time with Jim Welling. But it had turned out also that uh, Charles Ray heard that I was coming out. Um, and Charles Ray had uh, and has a deep passion for the sculpture of Anthony Caro. And he knew that I had had a very long and close relation with Caro. And he wanted to talk sculpture and could we possibly have a lunch before he flew off to Torino to see uh, his now wife, uh, Silvia Gaspardo Moro. Um, so we did. And we had a terrific uh, lunch. And that led on subsequent visits to my becoming familiar with Charlie's sculpture. And I discovered, and I am quite sure that it's not because I really like Charlie. Um, I can distinguish between simple human liking and the exigent artistic critical standards that I bring to encounters with works of art. I, I mean, my life is based on that principle. Um, uh, I discovered that I simply, I, I simply loved what he was doing. I found it very, very, very compelling. So among the three artists in this show, um, my close relation, uh, the work that I feel by far the closest to and the most understanding of um, is, is uh, Charlie's. I'm not going to give a whole uh, speech about it today, but I wanted to say that by way of uh, background. Now, the second thing that I want to say, going back, having a certain relation to the high modernist issue, is that um, I flew out here last night uh, but just a few days before, on Wednesday, February 26th, I was in London at the Tate, uh, one of four people speaking at a memorial for Anthony Caro, who died at the age of 89 uh, this, this last October 23rd. Caro is someone that I met um, literally when I was 22 um, and was completely swept away uh, by his sculpture at that time. Isabella has suggested in print that the model of my being swept away was falling in love when I, uh, this is what I call presentness and this extraordinary encounter that one can have with the work of art and feeling instantly convinced by it. And when I re read Isabella's suggestion that um, that kind of conviction was really modeled on love at first sight, I thought, this can't be right. That feels kind of shallow. And then I realized that I'd fallen in love with my wife at, at first sight, so that maybe the, uh, Isabella had a kind of profound point. Uh, <laughs> In any case, whatever, whatever the deep, erotic structure of this dynamic was, um, I 
have been a passionate uh, admirer of Caro's work throughout his career, and what and so has uh, Charlie's. And this is something um, that, that, that we have shared. I mentioned Caro um, because by far the great bulk of his production has been precisely abstract sculpture. And we're talking today about three sculptures, sculptors who who work, as it were, figuratively, though, of course, this isn't exactly, Hinoki is not exactly a figurative sculptor, sculpture. But um, the interesting issue uh, that's raised by this, and this is something that Charlie and I have certainly talked about more than once over the years, is the status of abstraction um, with respect to sculpture now. I mean, that is to say, it's not simply a matter of fashion that the movement has been away from abstraction, despite the fact that one senses that there's still enormous potential in abstract sculpture. I think part of the problem was that the two great abstract sculptors, Smith and Caro, used up so much creative room uh, between the two of them um, for, with respect to younger sculptors. But another, another uh, aspect, let me, do, let me also, let me interrupt myself and say, I, w I went over to London this last summer um, to see Caro, but also to see 12 sculptures that he had recently finished um, called the Park Avenue sculptures. Uh, these were, they initiated in a project uh, that he had accepted to make a large outdoors, half sculptural, half environmental construction that would run along the median strip uh, in the 60s on Park Avenue. There have been a number of these over the years, starting with Botero. And uh, Caro was seized by this and made a huge quarter scale model in the studio out of steel um, for what was to be a three block long sculpture. From my point of view, fortunately, the money was not forthcoming for the sculpture, for the project to be realized, because what it would have been would have been like a terrific outdoors three block long construction, it would not have been by the highest standards an autonomous work of high modernist art. Caro decided to take this large construction in the studio and break it up into 12 individual sculptures and over the next years wrestle those 12 sculptures into completely uh, definitive form, which he did. And they were shown at Gagosian's in London this last summer. Uh, they are magnificent. I mean, everyone should be aware that as recently as this last summer, the summer of 2014, a stupendous Sistine Chapel quality flowering of monumental magisterial abstract sculpture was still possible in the world. Um, so, so, and there's so little attention that's given to that kind of event, I feel I want to broadcast it here today, so that that the, 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 it, the possibilities of those kinds of high modernist values and even of abstraction simply can't be completely discounted from the contemporary situation, on the contrary. Now, I'm going to say just a little bit more about uh, Ray and uh, what I find in his work. For me, the key issue is not figurative um, or reproductive. Uh, what Ray has found in these, I mean, there's a, there are a number of things, but one of the things that he's found, and that is also present in other ambitious art of this moment, is a way to imbue the work of art with an extraordinary density of aesthetic intention, an extraordinary density of aesthetic decision. As I'm emphasizing aesthetic as opposed to merely technical or technological. Uh, in the to, to stress the fact that Ray is after certain particular, let us call them expressive or e effects, qualities. And the attempt, the, the, the pursuit of them requires a great deal of time, an enormous amount of correction and self-correction. And the quality of the work, the quality of a work like Hinoki, finally being produced by master carvers in Osaka over a period of years, the entire surface marked by gouges and cuts and drill marks and little pieces of shaving, left precisely so, as if to say the artist's intention has been absolute, his aesthetic will has been absolute, and it's actually then been delegated not, you might say, to a faceless crowd of technologists, but to 
makers who are saturating this work with particular aesthetic intentions. This links Ray's work, for example, to the photographs of Thomas Demand, to works in other media as well. And I see this focus on a density of aesthetic intention as being a mark of a moment when certain values and issues going back to high modernism, going back to the stress on autonomy, going back above all to the stress on the artist's intention as opposed to the idea that the viewer makes the work in, his, in the course of his or her experiencing of it is something that is, has returned um, in the art that, that I care about most. I'll just close by saying in Paris uh, not long ago, there were two exhibitions going on at the same time. Philippe Pereno at the uh, Palais de Tokyo and, uh, and Pierre Huyghe at the um, uh, Centre Pompidou. And in both cases, the exhibition itself, which should have been, which, it, which until recently would have been theorized, let's say under Nicolas Bourriot and, and relational aesthetics, as, as fields precisely for uh, the manipulation and the interaction with an experiencing audience whose experience would make the works, blah, blah, blah. Uh, in fact, what these artists had found their way to dialectically was the idea of an exhibition that would be so autonomous, uh, so much on the model itself of almost a kind of machine, that the exhibition itself was, as it were, in principle, indifferent to the presence of the beholder, indifferent to the audience. I'm not saying that that becomes completely realizable as an aesthetic ideal, but I am saying that in as an aesthetic ideal, it is markedly what I would call anti-theatrical. Okay, I will stop here. I just want to introduce a certain, uh, certain flavor of the past in our present deliberations. Thank you. <laughs>